Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. Hello, everybody. What is going on? Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander's Facts podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. It is Wednesday, August 16th, episode 115 of the podcast. That's a big one. And let me tell y'all, we got some big facts coming up this week. I was originally, let me just tell y'all, I was planning on doing another topic this week. But then, Monday night happens, and Monday you could kind of tell that it was going to happen. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the former president, Donnie Boy, who we talk about a lot on this podcast for someone we don't really love, was indicted criminally Whoops. for a fourth time. And this one... I know we said that about the first one, and then we said it about the second one, and then we said it about the third one. But this one, maybe it is actually, technically, the biggest yet, because in terms of page length, it is uh, quite a handful. But that all happened on Monday, and then so I was like, oh, we kind of have to talk about that. So, switched plans, we're going to do the topic that I plan to do in a couple weeks from now. This week, we are talking solely about the fourth Trump and Diamond in the state of Georgia. Everything you need to know. I've read it. It's 95 pages, but I read it. It took me a little bit, but I got through it. And so I've got all the facts to share with y'all. Make sure you don't get any misinformation. We're spreading only facts about this case on this podcast so you have everything you need to know about what is the hottest political topic of the week, of the month, of the year, really. So we'll talk about that in just a second, give you all the facts. But before we do, I just wanted to remind you all that if you like the Zader's Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like all the facts on this week's edition, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 115, rate and review the podcast, and then check us out on all the socials, Twitter, whatever it is, X threads, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Zader's Facts, that is Xander with a Z, and most importantly, Remember to tell all your friends around here. We'd like to call it Spread the Facts, Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast and our newsletter, Xander's Weekend Facts. If you haven't heard of it, it's on Substack. It's a recap of the week's top headlines. I write it, well, Saturday night, but then it comes out every Sunday morning. It is free to read and sign up to get in your email every Sunday morning. Check out the link in this episode's description. And then, of course, we have the Zader's Facts link tree, which has all the Zader's Facts links that you need. All the facts are on the link tree. It is linked in this episode's description. Go check it out. It's got all the links you need to find the podcast, the newsletter, all the facts are on the Zader's Facts link tree. So let's get to our main topic this week. It is usually I like to say we're just going to do a quick overview of this, quick overview of that, give you the facts. But y'all, I got to tell you, I got... A lot more notes than I usually do, so buckle in. Don't say I didn't warn you. Ugh. We got a lot of facts to get to this week because, ladies and gentlemen, it's not one, it's not two, not three, as LeBron James once said. Of course, he only won two in Miami. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. But it's the fourth. The number of the day is four. The fourth indictment has arrived Monday night. It was issued to the former president, Donald John Trump, who for the fourth time in this calendar year was indicted on criminal charges on Monday. And for the fourth time in this calendar year, we're going to be devoting some facts to talk about them. Because y'all, even though it feels like we're in the movie Groundhog Day, if you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day, you're just going in the endless cycle. Or the new movie, what's it called? Palm Springs. And we keep repeating ourselves. Because that's kind of what it feels like. It's still a pretty big deal when a former president is charged with a crime. Or several, in this case. Or in all four cases, he was charged with several crimes. We've gone over the previous indictments on the podcast and the newsletter. But before we get to these new criminal charges that come from the state of Georgia. Not the country. The state of Georgia. Let's just take a quick look back at the three previous indictments real quick. We had the first one. That was back on March 30th. It happened this year, y'all. It feels like it happened many years ago. It was 2023. Trump was criminally indicted on 34 felony counts by a grand jury in Manhattan. That was related to his role in payments of hush money 
which were paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels, oh my gosh, y'all remember her, in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. We previously talked about those on episode 100 of the podcast, if you want to go listen to that after this podcast is done, because we gotta get through these facts first, of course. But that all came from a criminal investigation that was opened way back in 2018 by the Manhattan District Attorney at the time, who was Cyrus Vance. It is now Alvin Bragg. That was into the reimbursement of then-Trump personal attorney Michael Cohen for those hush money payments. And then in 2020, that investigation then expanded into bank and insurance fraud by the Trump organization. Who would have thought? And so then in August of last year, a grand jury charged former Trump organization CFO Alan Weisselberg with grand larceny, criminal tax fraud, and falsifying business records, which he pled guilty to. And then in March, Trump was charged with falsifying business records. He, of course, pled not guilty. That trial is expected to begin in March of next year. 2024. These are facts. Then, number two, in June, the first of two indictments came down from the Justice Department and Special Counsel Jack Smith. This indictment was in regards to his handling of classified documents after he was president at his Mar-a-Lago residence in Florida. We talked about that two months ago or so, back on episode 109 of the podcast. We detailed the 40 felony counts that were included in that indictment. I think it was a little less back when we did it, but it's been revised now, so a couple more have been added. So it's now 40 felony counts. We also talked about who else was indicted because Trump's personally Walt Nauta was indicted. And then more recently, part of that revision, Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de Oliveira was also indicted with prosecutors saying he attempted to delete security cam footage after prosecutors had asked for it. So, you know, you can't really do that. We also talked about why the case differed from other handlings of classified documents from the current president, Joe Biden, former vice president, Mike Pence, a couple others. We talked about all that. And that case includes Trump being charged with willful retention of national defense information. Now, the Trump-appointed U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon of Florida has set the trial to begin as of now on May 14th of next year, which is just kind of like the last one in March, right in the middle of the presidential primary campaign, which is going to be going on next year. The first Republican presidential debate, I believe, is next week. Next week on Fox News. How about that? And then earlier this month, Number three, on August 1st, the Justice Department handed down its second indictment to the former president from the team led by the special counsel Jack Smith. Both of these federal cases, of course, had the charges ultimately approved by a grand jury that is what we say full of Trump's supposed peers, as in, you know, other U.S. citizens. We haven't talked about this case on the podcast, but I did do a wrap up about it on Xander's Weekend Facts a little over a week ago that was titled, if you want to read it, The Worst is Yet to Come for Trump. A little bit of a contrast from what Kimberly Guilfoyle likes to say. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. I don't know about that one, Chief. But that case, this one from August 1st, the number three case, stemmed from former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election, which, if you didn't know, he lost, by the way. This investigation, of course, began with the January 6th committee, which included both House Democrats and Republicans, as you may recall from last summer. They gave us lots of new footage, audio, and information when they presented their findings Now, we did talk about that a bunch in the newsletter and on the podcast last summer, so you should go check that out if you want to go find some of those. But Trump was also charged, in this case, with four criminal counts. Those are conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights. And as I headlined in my newsletter piece about a week and a half ago, Jack Smith's case is ultimately, you could kind of sum it up in the first two paragraphs of the indictment. I highlighted those on the newsletter, but I'll read them out to you here again because they're pretty important for this case. It reads, quote, 
The defendant, Donald J. Trump, was the 45th president of the United States and a candidate for re-election in 2020. The defendant lost the 2020 presidential election. Despite having lost, the defendant was determined to remain in power, so for more than two months following election day, on November 3, 2020, the defendant spread lies that there had been outcome determinative fraud in the election and that he had actually won. These claims were false, and the defendant knew that they were false but the defendant repeated and widely disseminated them anyway to make his knowingly false claims appear legitimate, create an intense national atmosphere of mistrust and anger, and erode public faith in the administration of the election, unquote. So that's how the indictment starts. And then, of course, after he appeared in a D.C. courtroom, he decided to make a statement at the airport and trash the city of Washington, D.C. for whatever reason. I was in D.C. last month. It was fine. Like, first off, quick sidebar. He goes into one of the most liberal cities in the country, Washington, D.C. 90% of voters, over 90%, I think, voted for Joe Biden and trashes it, says it's infested, terrible, it's disgusting. Could you imagine if Joe Biden went to whatever the freak, middle of nowhere, Nebraska? and said, this place sucks, it's garbage. Could you imagine the tears that would be flowing on Fox News, the anger that the right-wing media would have if Joe Biden said that? But Donald Trump goes into Washington, D.C., it's terrible, oh my gosh. Like, could you imagine? Disrespectful! Double standard, I'd say. But anyway, afterwards, he then decided to go on his Truth Social platform, which he loves to do, and, uh, write a message that said, quote, in all caps, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. You know, definitely not intimidation of the prosecution or potential witnesses or members of the jury. Nah, -uh, no way. So, yeah, there's all that. And for this case, trial date has not been set yet by the D.C. District Court Judge Tanya Chetkin, who, gasp, is an Obama appointee. Terrible. But prosecutors have requested that the case begin on January 2nd, of next year, while the Trump team, of course, wants to push the case past the 2024 election. But most people, like even the conservative, you know, voices on cable news and television and law scholars, they're all like, we should probably do this before the election. Like, wouldn't that be smart? Of course, Trump, you know, kind of doesn't want that to happen. It's probably going to happen anyway. So, as I said earlier, with those first two paragraphs of the indictment, Jack Smith's team lays out basically the fact that Trump knew that these claims were false, which is the argument he has to make because Trump's defense is probably either going to be that he has the First Amendment right, free speech rights, and he's protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution, which, you know, it likely doesn't in the case of inciting an insurrection, but, you know, or... His argument could be, or his defense team's argument could be, that he was too clueless to realize or know that the election wasn't actually stolen. His defense could be, this guy is a buffoon! Which, you'd think he'd have a shred of dignity left, but, uh, I don't- who knows? Sidebar, though, by the way, talking about the First Amendment and free speech, you do realize that not everything you say is protected under the clause, right? Story time! Like, if I say, if I go up to somebody and say, I'm gonna murder you, that's, like, not protected. Like, shouting fire in the crowded theater, that's not protected free speech. You go to jail for that, because you cause a panic, right? The First Amendment states, if you didn't know, if you haven't read the Constitution in a while, the First Amendment states, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free speech thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, unquote. So, brings me to my little sidebar. On Tuesday, I wanted to talk about this. This isn't really relevant to the Trump case, but I wanted to talk about it. On Tuesday, it was revealed that ESPN employee, you may know this name, Sage Steele, who was an anchor for Sports Center, which is the prime, you know, that's the highlight program of ESPN, is leaving the network after she settled a lawsuit where she accused ESPN and parent company Disney of violating her First Amendment rights. You see that segue that I made? 
Back in 2021, Steele went on a podcast that was hosted by former NFL quarterback Jay Cutler, and she decided to spew some BS, I guess. She went on to rail against ESPN's at the time mandate that all its employees get vaccinated against the coronavirus. Oh my gosh, the horror. She said, quote, I respect everyone's decision, I really do, but to mandate it is sick and it's scary to me in many ways, unquote. She ultimately did get vaccinated on the video version of that podcast. You can see she made sure to show everyone she got her band-aid on her arm. Like, wow, you're so brave fighting the establishment. Oh my gosh. Like, first off, it's a private company. Private companies can do what they want. You know, First Amendment protects you from the tyrannical government, which I know is taking away all your rights right now. I know everyone's very scared. But First Amendment, as has been shown time and time again, proven in the courts of law, does not protect you from what a private company, what your boss, can punish you for what you say, basically. That's, that's what happens. It's capitalism. So, but that wasn't all. She also decided to talk about the race of former President Barack Obama. Always a wonderfully calm and easily digestive topic, right? When she brought up the fact that Obama, who was biracial, like Steele, had chosen black on the census. She said, quote, I'm like, well, congratulations to the president. That's his thing. I think that's fascinating considering his black dad was nowhere to be found, but his white mom and grandma raised him. But hey, you do you. I'm going to do me, unquote. Like, what? First off, there's a lot of people online who like to correct people about what she said with the Obama stuff. And now she didn't actually say this. She said that. Can we just agree? It's a stupid claim. What are you talking about? That is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. I that, think that's fascinating. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, what are you talking about? Just get off on the soapbox. Steele then argued that ESPN punished her because of those comments and that her right to free speech had been violated. But ESPN argued that she hadn't been punished because there's no evidence of her pay ever being docked. So then we get to a Twitter or X, I don't know what it is anymore, message from Steele on Tuesday that says, quote, having successfully settled my case with ESPN slash Disney, Disney's the parent company of ESPN, I have decided to leave so that I can exercise my First Amendment rights more freely. I am grateful for so many wonderful experiences over the past 16 years and excited for my next chapter. Hashtag Steel Strong, unquote. Steel Strong, like, did your family home get hit by a tornado? Did you survive a bout with cancer? Steel Strong? I don't think so. But listen, if her First Amendment rights are in any way threatened by a private company, oh no. Listen, if the right wingers are persecuted, they have to stand strong, I guess. Oh, but you know, all the many blue checked friends that she has on Elon Musk's platform, they argued that personalities on the other side of the aisle have been free to say whatever they want without repercussions from ESPN, which is patently false. Like, I don't know if y'all remember, back in 2017, Jamel Hill is now a writer for The Atlantic, but she was a sports center anchor. She tweeted that Donald Trump was a white supremacist, which I mean, you know, was she wrong? But she got a warning from ESPN. But then White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who is now the tremendous governor of Arkansas, said that it was a fireable offense. That was a fireable offense. But what Sage Steele said, oh my gosh, how could you punish her for just expressing her mind? Free speech. Seriously? Interesting. But then, Jamel Hill only got a warning. Then, Hill was suspended from ESPN for two weeks later on after she said on Twitter that her followers should boycott businesses that were associated with the Dallas Cowboys, the NFL team, after their owner, Jerry Jones, took a hardline stance on players standing and not kneeling during the national anthem. Which, first off, if you're going to argue First Amendment rights, isn't it their First Amendment right not to stand? But, you know, oh my gosh, how could they? So, there's that instance to be like, really? The left, as you say, doesn't get punished for what they say? Well, there's that. And then, three years ago, 
In the summer of 2020, you may remember ESPN's NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski, Woj, was suspended after he said in an email to Missouri Republican Senator and notorious friend of the insurrectionist, Josh Hawley, quote, well, I guess I won't quote, but he did say F star 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 U. And of course, he didn't just type the letter F, he typed the letter F and then the letter U and, you know, the other two letters. So, you know, there's all that. But you know what? At least Sage is free from the shackles of ESPN and is now allowed to go to Fox or to Ku Klux Clay Travis's Outkick or Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire or whatever right wing cesspool pays her the most money to host the podcast where she gets her five seconds of fame and is finally able to express her true thoughts and emotions. That's worked out so well for many others who have left ESPN and sports to get into I'm going to speak the truth on the issues. Like Michelle Tafoya. Do y'all remember Michelle Tafoya? She was the NBC Sunday Night Football reporter. And then she decided, you know what? I don't want this cushy job anymore where I just have to stand on the sidelines and talk to players and all that stuff. I want to speak my mind. I want to tell the truth. So she launched a podcast, just like Xander. And one of her most recent podcast episodes is titled... Hunter, Hitler, and Hand Soap. What? So that's how it's going for Michelle Tafoya. Oh, and I was looking at her, you know, list of episodes because I was very fascinated. Oh my gosh, the Michelle Tafoya show. She has on her most recent podcast, the co-founder of Moms for Liberty. We talked about Moms for Liberty on a previous podcast. And let me tell y'all, they are not friendly. Yikes! So, what a delightful podcast, I mean, uh, I just, I had to get that off my chest. I know we're over 20 minutes into the podcast and we haven't even got to what we want to talk about. But listen, I had to, I had to get some facts out there in that conversation because I was looking at that Tuesday. I was just like, oh, oh boy. So, yes, those are the three previous indictments that are facing former President Donald Trump. And now we have a fourth. And this week I wanted to talk about the case because I wanted to learn all the facts. I wanted to learn all the facts personally, and then I wanted to share them with all you fact finders. Because before you get to hear the squabble, dobble, defense of whatever is going to happen on the platforms of Sean Hannity and whoever's replaced Rush Limbaugh, Rush, you should probably get the facts before you hear all that whatever. So let's get to it. What is all the hubbub on the fourth indictment of Donald Trump? Trump. Before we dive in to that 95-page indictment, it's pretty long, y'all, let's just take a look at the basics of this case. Unlike the previous two cases that were brought by the federal special counsel Jack Smith in the federal courts, this case has been brought by Fonnie Willis. She is the district attorney of Fulton County, Georgia, which contains about 90% of the city of Atlanta. It has just over a million residents, so Fulton County's population makes up a, almost 10% of the entire state's population of 10.7 million people. Just to let you know. Fact, Nugget! That means that this case is under the jurisdiction of the state of Georgia. It is not under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Just like the first Trump indictment. That hush money case, that's under the jurisdiction of the state of New York because it was brought by the Manhattan District Attorney. But what this case does have in common with one of those federal cases is the subject of the crimes, because when Willis opened the criminal investigation back in February of 2021, it came just a couple months after multiple recounts had confirmed, as we know, that Joe Biden won the state and its 16 electoral votes in the 2020 presidential election. First Democrat, by the way, to win the state in a presidential election since Bill Clinton in 1996. But as we know, that did not stop the former president, Donald Trump, who won the state in 2016 but then lost it in 2020 from arguing that he did win. Because if you will recall, the former president picked up the phone on January 2nd, 2021, three days before the runoff Senate elections in Georgia that ultimately gave Democrats the majority in the Senate, and four days before January 6th, we know what happened on that day in 2021. But on January 2nd, Trump did a little call to Georgia's Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. It was an hour-long call. If y'all remember, it was quite the thing. I'm not going to play the whole hour-long call on this podcast, even though 
I mean, if you've if you've got the humor for it, it's pretty good stuff. And I think I've probably played some parts of the audio here on this podcast before, but I'm going to play about a four minute snippet that was taken by the Washington Post that I guess we can kind of consider like the best of of this infamous recording that was taken by the Secretary of State's office because they probably took that recording because I think they knew stuff was going to go down. They were like, we're going to Trump. We should probably record this. And they did. So there's three people in this call. There's the former president, Donald Trump. He was president at the time. Brad Raffensperger, the secretary of state of Georgia, and then the secretary of state's general counsel, Ryan Germany. So here's that audio. Let's play it. We have won this election in Georgia based on all of this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with, with saying that, Brad. You know, I mean, having, the, having a correct... You, the people of Georgia are angry. And these numbers are going to be repeated on Monday night, along with others that we're going to have by that time, which are much more substantial even. And the people of Georgia are angry. The people of the country are angry. And there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Now, do you think it's possible that they uh, shredded ballots in uh, Fulton County? Because... That's what the rumor is. And also that Dominion took out machines. Uh, that Dominion is really moving fast to get rid of their uh, machinery. Do you know anything about that? Because that's illegal. No, Ryan, Germany. No, Dominion has not um, moved any machinery out of Fulton County. We're having. Well, but no, but, but have they moved? Have they have they moved the inner parts of the machines and replaced them with other parts? No. You sure, Ryan? I'm sure. You should want to have an accurate election. And you're a Republican. We believe that we do have an accurate election. No, I no, you don't. No, no, you don't. You don't have. You don't have. Not even close. You got, you're off by hundreds of thousands of votes. You know what they did and you're not reporting it. That's a, you know, that's a criminal, that's a criminal offense. And, and, you know, you can't let that happen. That's that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. But they are shredding ballots, in my opinion, based on what I've heard. And they are removing machinery. Uh, and they're moving it as fast as they can, both of which are criminal fines. And you can't let it happen. And you are letting it happen. Oh, you know, I mean, I'm notifying you that you're letting it happen. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? We won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways. And... I think you have to say that you're going to re-examine it, and you can re-examine it, but, but re-examine it with people that want to find answers, not people that don't want to find answers. Uh, for instance, I'm hearing Ryan, and he's probably, I'm sure, a great lawyer and everything, but he's making statements about those ballots that he doesn't know. But he's making them with such, he, he did make them with surety, but now I think he's less sure, because the answer is they all went to Biden. And that alone wins us the election by a lot. You know, so. Mr. President, uh, you have people that submit information, and we have our people that submit information, and then it comes before the court, and the court then has to make a determination. We have to stand by our numbers. We believe our numbers are right. Well, under law, you're not allowed to give faulty election results, okay? You're not allowed to do that, and that's what you've done. This is a faulty election result. And honestly, this should go very fast. You should meet tomorrow because you have a big election election coming up. And because of what you've done to the president, you know, the people of, of uh, Georgia know that this was a scam. And because of what you've done to the president, a lot of people aren't going out to vote. And a lot of Republicans are going to vote negative because they hate what you did to the president. OK, they hate it. And they're going to vote. And if you would be respected if really respected if this thing could be straightened out 
before the election. You have a big election coming up on Tuesday. Guys, guys, come on. All he needs is 11,780 votes. Just one more. You know how much he lost the state by? 11,779 votes. I, all he needs, 11,780. That's all he needs. Uh, why can't he get them? Oh boy. I don't know. I don't know. So, you know, we've had that audio for over two years now. And Fonnie Willis probably could have just handed out the charges based on that. Like, that, that's pretty incriminating. But what Willis has been doing over the last two years has been gathering evidence and witnesses. She had 75 witnesses testify before a special grand jury for this case. And then this summer, she had a regular grand jury presented the evidence that she compiled, that her team compiled. And then they ultimately voted on Monday night to approve the indictment in Fulton County in Georgia. The indictment is pretty long. 98 pages. I think I said 95 earlier. It's 98 pages. That is over double the length of the indictment from Jack Smith's January 6th case because it involves a lot more people other than Trump. A total of 19 individuals, including Trump, were named as co-defendants and were charged in this case, some of whom you've probably heard of, others maybe not, but there's 41 total counts, total crimes that in this case that are spread across these individuals. And we've also got 30 unindicted co-conspirators, but they haven't been named, sadly. I'd like to know those names. But we do know the 19 that have been charged, and I'm going to give you their names. Even though it's on the front of the indictment, if you want to read along, that's cool. But basically, I'm going to outline who these people are, what their relation was. So, number one, of course, Donald John Trump, DJT. Who? Number two, Rudolph Giuliani, America's mayor, Rudy. That's right. It's mayor Rudy Giuliani. Always amazing to see you. Love you. Sorry. I'm, oh. I, I'm, a, I'm just so honored always, as always, to uh, interview you, sir. The former federal prosecutor and mayor of New York, along with being a part of Trump's personal legal team back in the day while Trump was president. Rudy's on there. Uh, we've also got John Eastman. He's a former Supreme Court clerk to the one and only Clarence Thomas and a conservative attorney who helped Trump allies contest the election in several states. Mark Meadows, he was Trump's last White House chief of staff. He was on that call between Trump and Raffensperger. And before being chief of staff, he was a member of the House and of the far-right conservative House Freedom Caucus. You've also got, oh, the best name on here. Kenneth Cheesebro. That's right, y'all. Cheesebro is a Trump attorney who also assisted in trying to halt the certification of the Electoral College and who we believe is one of six co-conspirators that have not been publicly named in the federal January 6th case from Jack Smith. We also believe that Rudy Giuliani is another co-conspirator, but that's technically not official. It's just been reported. You've also got, in this case... Jeffrey Clark. He is a former Justice Department official who Trump wanted to install as acting attorney general back in the day because he would have assisted in trying to overturn the election. Oh my gosh. But Trump and Clark ultimately had to back down because a bunch of officials of the Justice Department were threatening to resign. So there was going to be this mass resignation. That would have been good. So they ultimately had to be stopped. Then you've also got Jenna Ellis, a very vocal Twitter personality, I would say. Ellis is a lawyer who was a part of the Trump campaign and promoted misinformation during a legislative hearing about the election. You also have Ray Smith III, another lawyer for the Trump campaign, who requested that state lawmakers appoint a different set of electors who would have cast their votes for Trump instead of Biden. That's kind of illegal. Robert Cheely is a Georgia lawyer who communicated with Eastman about the fake electors plan. Michael Roman was the director of Election Day operations for the Trump campaign. David Schaefer is a former state senator and chairman emeritus of the Georgia Republican Party. Sean Still is a Republican member of the Georgia State Senate, tried to be a presidential elector, even though he was not one. That's kind of illegal. Stephen Lee is a pastor from Illinois. He was accused of trying to pressure former election worker Ruby Freeman. She, by the way, if you remember from last summer, testified before the House January 6th committee. You've also got Willie Lewis Floyd, who is the director of Black Voices Trump. 
who also is charged with pressuring Ruby Freeman. Then you've got Trevian Cootie, a former publicist for the infamous Ye Kanye West, also charged with planning to pressure Ruby Freeman. You've got Sidney Powell, who was a conservative lawyer who was involved in meetings at the White House where plans to contest an election results were made. Uh-oh, Powell allegedly coordinated with the data company Sullivan Strickler to access election data from Coffee County, Georgia, which is in the southern part of the state. You've got Scott Hall, who was a Georgia bail bondsman accused of helping with the unlawful breach of election equipment and theft of voter data in Coffee County. And then finally, Misty Hampton, who is a former election supervisor for Coffee County. She is accused of allowing two co-conspirators to enter non-public areas of the Coffee County Board of Elections and Registration Office and allowing them to access voting equipment. So what they accused the other side of doing, uh, they actually did themselves. Okay. So, those are the people who are involved. What are the charges? And not everyone is charged with the same thing in this. All 19 are charged with at least something but what they're charged with does vary. Now, there's 41 different counts in this indictment. Some are charged with some of the counts. Some are charged with others. But there is one count that all 19 are charged of. It's the main count. It is count number one. Ooh. It states in the indictment, quote, The grand jurors aforesaid in the name and behalf of the citizens of Georgia do hereby charge and accuse... It lists the names everybody's listed with the offense of violation of the Georgia RICO Act, unquote. So if you've been following the news recently, you've probably heard RICO, R-I-C-O, been mentioned a lot. But if you're like me, they started mentioning that and I was like, what is RICO? I have no idea what RICO is and why it's so important. So I'm going to tell y'all, RICO, R-I-C-O, stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations. Now, back in 1970, the federal government passed the RICO Act, which provides extended criminal penalties and a civil cause of action for acts that were performed as part of an ongoing criminal investigation. The law was originally used to pursue mafia bosses who had others carry out their crimes on their behalf. That means that a prosecutor needs to show a pattern of racketeering activity that is carried out by two or more people and seeks to control or protect an interest in some sort of enterprise. And an enterprise can basically be a gang, a crime family, or it could be property, an interest, or an institution, you know, like a political campaign or the office of president. So the federal government has their own RICO law. But also, over half of the 50 states have passed their own RICO laws, including Georgia. Now, Georgia's law defines racketeering more broadly than the federal law, and it also allows prosecutors to use crimes that were committed in other jurisdictions beyond the state of Georgia to prove a wider conspiracy, which the prosecution has done in this case, because later on we're going to see they cite operations from the Trump team in other states besides Georgia. Now, if convicted under just this count, the sentence is 5 to 20 years, which can be probation, or it can be prison time, or it can be a mixture of both. And there can also be a fine. So, count one is basically all about the RICO Act. And what's particularly amusing, actually, about this is that when Rudy Giuliani, before he was mayor of New York, when he was a federal prosecutor... He often used the RICO law when prosecuting some of the more notorious organized crime families in New York. Now, almost four decades later, Giuliani is being charged under a similar version of that law in Georgia, which is chef's kiss. That's impressive. So ultimately, what the indictment needs to prove are that the defendants were a part of an enterprise, almost like a gang or a mob that were working on behalf of the top guy, which in this case is the former president. Now, the indictment introduces this charge in three important paragraphs, which I'm going to read to you. And also, by the way, you can follow along because I linked the indictment on the episode description. There's a link so you can read it yourself, all 98 pages. And there's also an annotated version, which gives you more context from the New York Times. I also linked that in the episode description, so you can go check those out as well. Just... 
making sure that nobody accuses me of saying anything false or not a fact, because I'm basically, I'm reading from the indictment. They're all facts. How about that? So the introduction paragraph of this first count says, quote, Defendant Donald John Trump lost the United States presidential election held on November 3rd, 2020. One of the states he lost was Georgia. Trump and the other defendants charged in this indictment refused to accept that Trump lost, and they knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of Trump. That conspiracy contained a common plan and purpose to commit two or more acts of racketeering activity in Fulton County, Georgia, elsewhere in the state of Georgia, and in other states, unquote. So you can see... It's outlining why it's a violation of the RICO law. And so then we get into the next two paragraphs, which are labeled as the Enterprise. So it goes, quote, At all times relevant to this count of the indictment, the defendants, as well as others not named as defendants, unlawfully conspired and endeavored to conduct and participate in a criminal enterprise in Fulton County, Georgia, and elsewhere. Defendants, it lists all the defendants' names again, unindicted co-conspirators, individual 1 through individual 30, and others known and unknown to the grand jury, constituted a criminal organization whose members and associates engaged in various related criminal activities, including, but not limited to, false statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, computer invasion of privacy, conspiracy to defraud the state, acts involving theft, and perjury. This criminal organization constituted an enterprise as that term is defined in the official code of Georgia, that is, a group of individuals associated in fact. Fact. The defendants and other members and associates of the Enterprise had connections and relationships with one another and with the Enterprise. The Enterprise constituted an ongoing organization whose members and associates functioned as a continuing unit for a common purpose of achieving the objectives of the Enterprise. The Enterprise operated in Fulton County, Georgia, elsewhere in the state of Georgia, in other states too, including, but not limited to, Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and in the District of Columbia. The enterprise operated for a period of time sufficient to permit its members and associates to pursue its objectives. Unquote. So, you can see, the indictment lays out how these crimes would be punishable under the RICO Act because of the number of individuals associated along with the crimes that the indictment says were committed. If you say so. So then, the indictment lists eight manners and methods that the defendants used to further the goals of what is being called the Enterprise, which also includes at least some, if not all, of those 30 unnamed co-conspirators, the ones we don't know but haven't been charged. So, those eight manners and methods. Number one, false statements to and solicitation of state legislatures. The indictment claims here that several of the defendants appeared at three hearings before members of the Georgia General Assembly in December of 2020 and made false statements concerning fraud in the presidential election. Number two, false statements to and solicitation of high-ranking state officials. The indictment claims that several of the defendants made false statements to the governor of Georgia, Republican Brian Kemp, the Secretary of State, Republican Brad Raffensperger, and the Speaker of the State House of Representatives, Republican David Ralston, who died in November of 2022. It also alleges that members of the enterprise, quote-unquote, corruptly solicited Georgia officials, including the Secretary of State and the Speaker of the House, to violate their oaths to both the Georgia and the U.S. constitutions by unlawfully changing the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Then there's number three, creation and distribution of false electoral college documents. The indictment here accuses members of the enterprise of creating false electoral college documents and recruiting individuals to convene and cast false electoral college votes when the state's vote took place at the Georgia State Capitol in Atlanta on December 14th, 2020. The indictment continues. It says, quote, after the false electoral votes were cast, Members of the Enterprise transmitted the votes to the President of the United States Senate 
That's the vice president. It was Mike Pence at the time. The archivist of the United States, the Georgia Secretary of State, and the chief judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. The false documents were intended to disrupt and delay the joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021, in order to unlawfully change the outcome of the November 3, 2020 presidential election in favor of Donald Trump, unquote. Number four, harassment and intimidation of Fulton County election worker Ruby Freeman. So at this point, the indictment accuses members of the enterprise of falsely accusing Freeman of committing election crimes in Fulton County. The false accusations were repeated to Georgia legislators and other Georgia officials in an attempt to persuade them to change the outcome of the election. The indictment also says that some defendants, quote, traveled from out of state to harass Freeman, intimidate her, and solicit her to falsely confess to election crimes that she did not commit, unquote. You've also got number five, solicitation of high-ranking United States Department of Justice officials. The indictment here accuses members of the enterprise of corruptly soliciting high-ranking U.S. Department of Justice officials, quote, to make false statements to government officials in Fulton County, Georgia, including the governor, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and the President Pro Tempore of the Senate, unquote. The next part I read was one of the more shocking things that I found in this indictment. It says, quote, In one instance, Donald Trump stated to the acting United States Attorney General, just say that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman, unquote. Which I guess really shouldn't shock me at this point, but it's still, it's like, whoa. And ultimately, that's kind of why I think, in this case, if he decides to use that argument, and in the federal January 6th case, if they try and use the argument that he was dumb enough to think that the election was actually stolen, quotes like that, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman, that's a quote that kind of infers that, like, oh, you know it's not corrupt, but you want us to say it anyway. So that kind of blows that defense argument out of the water, I think, but either way. Number six, solicitation of the vice president of the United States. Here, the indictment accuses members of the enterprise of corruptly soliciting the vice president to violate federal law and the Constitution of the U.S., by unlawfully rejecting the Electoral College votes cast in Georgia and in other states. Number seven, unlawful breach of election equipment in Georgia and elsewhere. The indictment also accuses members of the enterprise of corruptly conspiring to, quote, unlawfully access secure voting equipment and voter data. In Georgia, members of the enterprise stole data, including ballot images, voting equipment software, and personal voter information. The stolen data was then distributed to other members of the enterprise, including members in other states. Unquote. What are you talking about? So, basically, what they accused the other, the Democrats, what they accused the Democrats of doing, and Dominion voting machines. That's why Fox News is out almost a billion dollars, because they had to pay Dominion all that money. Because of those claims that were repeated on Fox News airwaves. And they were the ones actually taking the voting machines. I mean, wow. And then number eight, obstructive acts in furtherance of the conspiracy and the cover-up. Finally, here the indictment accuses members of the enterprise of filing false documents, giving false statements to government investigators, and committing perjury in judicial proceedings in Fulton County and elsewhere, to cover up the conspiracy. So those are basically what the indictment says are the methods that the defendants used to help further the goals of the enterprise, as the indictment says. Or basically, in plainer terms, what was their goal? Overturn the results of the 2020 election. But that, again, is just count one. And it somehow doesn't even stop there, because it then goes on for another whole lot of pages, and it lists a total of 161 overt acts, is what it calls them, that were committed to affect the objectives of the enterprise. It lists these under the heading of acts of racketeering activity and overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy. So these basically go into more detail 
on the actual events that transpired that go into the eight manners and methods that we just went over. Now, obviously, I'm not gonna read out all 161 overt acts for you. <coughs> you can go read them on that indictment, but I am gonna highlight some of the more notable ones. Now, if you're looking at the indictment, it does list them in chronological order, starting from the day after the 2020 election, all the way up to when Act Number 161 was committed, when one of the defendants is accused of committing perjury on September 15th, 2022. So the very first act was the televised speech that then President Donald Trump made on November 4th, 2020, the day after the election, when he falsely declared victory. Now, the indictment notes there that on October 31st, four days earlier, Trump discussed a draft speech with unindicted co-conspirator individual number one, oh boy, we don't know who that is, that falsely declared victory and falsely claimed voter fraud. So, four days before, all right, well, if we lose, there's voter fraud, clearly, so let's just talk about it. Like, oh, okay. But when taking a look at all 161 acts as a whole, some of the acts include phone calls that were taking place between some of the defendants and other defendants, unindicted co-conspirators or others. Some of the acts detail emails that were sent, others detail meetings that took place, and others are literally just tweets from Trump. Like Act Number 26, which lists a Trump tweet from December 3rd, 2020, that states, quote, Wow. Blockbuster testimony taking place right now in Georgia. Ballot stuffing by Dems when Republicans were forced to leave the large counting room. Plenty more coming, but this alone leads to an easy win of the state. Unquote. Of course, we know that the testimony that was being given by the Trump team was false and was knowingly false, as is laid out in this indictment. The New York Times annotated version of the indictment, which as I said is linked below, you can check it out, notes that it would be difficult to actually prove that a single tweet was a criminal act on its own, but the prosecutors are suggesting that the several tweets they included are each part of the larger conspiracy to obstruct the election. Like, maybe that tweet I just read wasn't a crime in and of itself. But when you put it into context and put it into this larger conspiracy, then you can kind of see how it's further advancing the crime, you know? So then another of these notable events was detailed in Act 112, which is the infamous phone call we played earlier between Trump and Raffensperger. And that indictment argues that Trump and his then chief of staff, Mark Meadows, committed the felony offense of solicitation of violation of oath by public officer by, quote, unlawfully soliciting, requesting, and importuning Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a public officer, to engage in conduct constituting the felony offense of violation of oath by public officer, by unlawfully altering, unlawfully adjusting, and otherwise unlawfully influencing the certified results for presidential electors for the November 3, 2020 presidential election in Georgia in willful and intentional violation of the terms of the oath of said person as prescribed by law with intent that said person engage in such conduct, unquote. So, if we move beyond count one, which, as I said, is by far the most expansive in this indictment, it takes up 58 pages, well over half of the indictment, there's, you know, 40 other counts in this indictment. But in regards to Trump, he's charged with 12 others, so there's 13 total charges for him. So let me just outline those real quickly. Here comes a fact! He is charged with the fifth count, solicitation of violation of oath by public officer. This relates to a December 2020 call that Trump made to then-Georgia House Speaker David Ralston, where Trump urged Ralston to call lawmakers back into session to support the fake electors, but Ralston refused. Also, count nine he's charged with, conspiracy to commit impersonating a public officer, Trump and others, including Giuliani, Eastman, and Cheesebro, and others, are accused of conspiring to cause the fake electors to hold themselves out as the real ones. He's also charged with count 11, conspiracy to commit forgery in the first degree. Trump and others are accused of unlawfully conspiring with the intent to defraud to knowingly make a document 
titled, quote, Certificate of the Votes of the 2020 Electors from Georgia, which they obviously didn't have the authority to do so. He is also charged with count 13, conspiracy to commit false statements and writings. Trump and others are accused of making that previously mentioned document and then placing false statements in it. There's also count 15, conspiracy to commit filing false documents. Trump and others are accused of conspiring to knowingly file, enter, and record that document, knowing that the information in it is false. He's also charged with count 17, which is conspiracy to commit forgery in the first degree. Again, you saw that earlier. Trump and others are accused of unlawfully conspiring with the intent to defraud, to knowingly create a document that is titled, quote, re, notice of filing of electoral college vacancy, unquote, which purports to have been made by the authority of the actual presidential electors from Georgia. Of course, they didn't give that authority. He is also charged with count 19, which is conspiracy to commit false statements and writings. Trump and others are accused of making that previously mentioned document and then placing false statements in it like the previous document. And then he's also charged with count 27, which is filing false documents. Trump and Eastman are accused of filing a document which is titled, quote, verified complaint for emergency injunctive and declaratory relief, unquote in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia. That includes six statements that are materially false. Now, they laid them out for us. They include, number one, quote, that as many as 2,506 felons with an uncompleted sentence voted illegally in the 2020 presidential election in Georgia. That's not true. Number two, that at least 66,247 Underage people voted illegally in the 2020 presidential election in Georgia. Also not true. Number three, that at least 2,423 individuals voted illegally in the 2020 presidential election in Georgia, who were listed in the state's record as having been registered to vote. Number four, that at least 1,043 individuals voted illegally in the 2020 presidential election, who had illegally registered to vote from using a postal office box as their habitation that is not true number five that as many as 10,315 or more dead people voted in the 2020 presidential election in georgia and number six that deliberate misinformation was used to instruct republican poll watchers and members of the press to leave the premises for the night at approximately 10 p.m. on November 3rd, 2020, at State Farm Arena in Fulton County, Georgia, unquote. So they're saying that the Democrats conspired to tell everybody, oh, Republicans, you can just leave at 10 p.m. and then we're going to, you know, count all these votes for Biden, da-da-da. That's, <laughs> that's what they said happened. It did not happen. All of those statements were found by a federal court to be un. True. Guaranteed. He is also charged with count 28, which is solicitation of violation of oath by public officer. Now, Trump and Meadows are accused of unlawfully soliciting, requesting, and importuning Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a public officer, to engage in conduct constituting a felony offense. Now, that, of course, is related to the January 2nd, 2021 phone call that we played earlier that I said Trump was obviously talking, but Mark Meadows was also on the line for that call. And he's also charged with count 29 false statements and writings, which I think might be my favorite one here because Trump is accused of making the following 13 false statements in that January 2nd, 2021 phone call to Raffensperger to Georgia Deputy Secretary of State Jordan Fuchs, who was also on the call and to Georgia Secretary of State General Counsel Ryan Germany. So the prosecution did us the favor, took the time to find the false statements that Trump made in that phone call and lay them out for us. So they came up with 13 false statements in that call. I'm going to read them out for you. Number one, that anywhere from 250,000 to 300,000 ballots were dropped mysteriously into the rolls in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia. Number two, that thousands of people attempted to vote in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia 
and were told they could not because a ballot had already been cast in their name. Number three, that 4,502 people voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia who were not on the voter registration list. Number four, that 904 people voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia who were registered at an address that was a post office box. Five, that Ruby Freeman was a professional, a professional vote scammer and a known political operative. Oh boy. Number six, that Ruby Freeman, her daughter, and others were responsible for fraudulently awarding at least 18,000 ballots to Joseph R. Biden at State Farm Arena in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia. Like, I don't know why they keep attacking Ruby Freeman. Like, what did she ever do? Nothing. She didn't commit any crime. She was just a poll worker. But you know what? You know what? She is a black woman. I mean, I guess we have to take that into consideration with people like, you know, him. Then we've got number seven, that close to 5,000 dead people voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia. Number eight, that 139% of people voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in the city of Detroit, Michigan. Number nine, that 200,000 more votes were recorded than the number of people who voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Pennsylvania. Number 10, that thousands of dead people voted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Michigan. Number 11, that Ruby Freeman stuffed the ballot boxes. I mean, uh, again. Number 12, that hundreds of thousands of ballots had been dumped into Fulton County and another county adjacent to Fulton County in the election in Georgia. And 13, that he won the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia by 400,000 votes. These are not Sandra's facts. All of those claims have been found to be, y'all, false. But he said them anyway. By the way, in 2016, when he won the state by, I believe, about five points, he only won by less than 200,000 votes. Now he's saying, I won by 400,000, even though he actually lost. So I like all that because those are all the false claims that he made. And then we've also got two more counts. 38, which is solicitation of violation of oath by public officer. Trump is accused on September 17th, 2021. This is almost a year after the election, y'all, of unlawfully soliciting, requesting, and importuning Brad Raffensperger to engage in conduct constituting a felony offense by unlawfully, quote, decertifying the election or whatever the correct legal remedy is and announce the true winner unquote so almost a year after the election he won't stop he's like you still need to do this you forgot to do it like come on i mean good grief and then count 39 false statements and writings where trump is accused of making the following statement to raffensperger on that same day quote as stated to you previously, the number of false and or irregular votes is far greater than needed to change the Georgia election result, unquote. Obviously, that has been found to not be true. So then, after count 41, there you go. The indictment's done. So, y'all, take a breath. We're done with all the legal mumbo-jumbo. No more reading from the indictment. But now I wanted to get into... What is likely to come next? So, in this case, District Attorney Fonnie Willis has given the 19 defendants until next Friday, August 25th, at noon Eastern Time, to voluntarily surrender, and she also said that she's requesting a trial date within the next six months, which of course would be well before the 2024 presidential election next November, if that happens. Now, since Trump has voluntarily been taken into custody in the three previous arraignments, you'd expect he'd do the same this time in the next 10 days or so. But, uh, I, you never know, I guess. I don't know. But when Trump arrives at the courthouse, which I'm sure is going to be a television spectacle, watching his motorcade drive up to the courthouse, just like it has been in the previous three instances, He's expected to have his finger printed, along with his mugshot taken, which hasn't happened yet, or we haven't seen one yet. And when he's forced to make a plea, it's likely going to be not guilty, just like the other three times. 
Now, Willis said in a press conference Monday night that she does plan to hold the trial for all 19 defendants together, which, as you'd probably think, would be a massive undertaking. Now, we've already learned that Mark Meadows has requested that his trial be moved to a federal court because, of course, he wants to get it dismissed. Doubt that's going to happen. But one of the reasons we saw Jack Smith try and keep his indictments quick and simple is because he wants to get on with these trials as fast as possible, knowing that there's probably already going to be interference from the Trump defense team. So we'll see if Willis's team can keep it all together in time for a speedy trial date. And then, of course, you know, what's going on right now? You have Republicans coming to Trump's defense, like the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, who, by the way, I mean, he's gone over half a year being Speaker of the House. That's like, nobody thought that was going to happen. Congratulations. He claimed on Twitter, or X, or whatever, quote, Justice should be blind, but Biden has weaponized government against his leading political opponent to interfere in the 2024 election, end quote. Oh my gosh, he got us, y'all. But just remember, y'all, this is not even the doing of the federal government. It's from an over two-year investigation by a Georgia district attorney who, oh my gosh, gasps, is a registered Democrat. Of course, all district attorneys are registered something, independent, Democrat, Republican. But you know what? You know who also is a Democrat? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I don't know if you all have been hearing what RFK Jr. has been saying recently, but it's not very aligned with the Democratic Party. Now, I'm not saying Fonnie Willis's beliefs are crazy, especially regarding vaccines like RFK Jr., but what I'm saying is, after reading that 98-page indictment, it's pretty clear this isn't based off political bias, it's based off of clear facts. And in the case of the federal cases, Jack Smith was a special counsel appointed by the Attorney General that was done because the Justice Department wanted as much separation as possible because obviously the attorney general is appointed by the president and then they're supposed to act separately. The president is not supposed to influence the Justice Department. So they appointed the special counsel to put as much separation as possible. But of course, some people won't stop complaining. The wonderful, oh, who we love on this podcast, Ben Shapiro, Talks really fast, decided to tweet in response to the indictment. Should I, should I try and read it like him? Whatever you think of the Trump indictments, one thing is for certain. The glass has now been broken over and over again. Political opponents can be targeted by legal enemies. Running for office now carries the risk of going to jail on all sides. Unquote. That probably wasn't very good. That was terrible. Not true again, though. As I just mentioned, this is not Biden prosecuting Trump. It's the justice system in this country doing so which as much as Trump wanted while he was president, as is detailed in the indictment, the justice system of this country is not something the office of the president is a part of, nor should it be if we want to be considered a democracy. Of course, back in 2014 on the topic of indicting presidents, Shapiro said, here we go, and we start treating them as criminals, maybe they'll think twice before they act so criminally in the future. Unquote. The thing about people like him is that you know, you know, they don't truly believe what they say, especially in this case. Like, you really believe that, Ben? Or are you just placating to your base? It's the same way for people like Candace Owens and Ku Klux Clay Travis, people who previously have advocated for the other side until they realize that their grift wasn't really working and it would be much more beneficial for them on the other side of the spectrum. These people are truly the worst because they blabber nonsense that they know people who are encapsulated into a bubble, a brainwashed bubble, will believe, but the people who are saying it don't even believe it. Now listen, y'all, that is not me, because I believe everything I say on this podcast. I've believed everything I've said today on this episode. You can be 100% sure, factual about that. 
I believed everything I've said on the past 114 episodes of the podcast, and I'm going to believe everything I say on however many future episodes of this podcast we have. I'm not a grifter, y'all. I don't make any money on this podcast, so I say whatever I feel like. Cool facts, bro. Unlike the ones I just mentioned. But anyway, even after Trump continues to attack individuals he probably shouldn't on Truth Social, after he sent out that, if you go after me, I'm coming after you message, which, okay, the prosecution immediately requested a protective order to require Trump not to share evidence regarding the federal January 6th case. And legal experts say if he continues his attacks, that a judge could ultimately revoke his bail and place him in jail. How about that rhyme? Now, would that actually happen? Is that going to happen? Probably not. But if it does, if he keeps going off his rockers, then it's probably warranted. But in regards to the Georgia case, he then wrote on Monday, quote, I am reading reports that failed former Lieutenant Governor of Georgia, Jeff Duncan, will be testifying before the Fulton County Grand Jury. He shouldn't. I barely knew him, but he was, right from the beginning of this witch hunt, a nasty disaster for those looking into the election fraud that took place in Georgia. He refused having a special session to find out what went on, became very unpopular with Republicans, I refused to endorse him, and fought the truth all the way. A loser, he went to FNCNN. Unquote. I'm not sure, I don't even want to guess what FNCNN means, But that's definitely not witness intimidation, right? Like, no way. Like, listen, we're not talking about some, like, moderate, old-school Republican, like, John McCain here. We're talking about hardline, very conservative Republicans, like Brad Raffensperger and Jeff Duncan, who was the Republican lieutenant governor of Georgia at the time of the 2020 election. But just like Liz Cheney, who, if y'all remember was one of the most conservative members of the U.S. House when she was in there. If you don't bow down to dear leader just one time, you're out. That's the mentality right now that's going on in the Republican Party. Because I guarantee you, on basically every other issue, Trump and Jeff Duncan and Rad Raffensperger are in lockstep. But on this particular one, they are not. And so then Tuesday morning, we got another message from good old Donnie Boy on his Truth Social. He said, quote, a large, complex, detailed, but irrefutable report on the presidential election fraud, which took place in Georgia, is almost complete and will be presented by me at a major news conference at 11 a.m. on Monday of next week in Bedminster, New Jersey. Based on the results of this conclusive report, All charges should be dropped against me and others. There will be a complete exoneration. They never went after those that rigged the election. They only went after those that fought to find the riggers. Unquote. Riggers. Whoa. Oh boy, you gotta be careful there. That's a hard R. Holy cow. Was he trying to say something else? (laughs) Was his autocorrect changing it to something else there? Riggers. Oh boy, I don't know. But as we detailed in the indictment, it's the other way around, Donny boy. But also, why did he wait three years to produce this? All of a sudden, we're just hearing about this, this report. I'm going to call BS on that. I think he's doing this probably for two reasons. One, maybe because he's trying to prove that defense of, Oh, I am an idiot. I didn't know that the election wasn't stolen. He might be trying to play into that, or his lawyers are telling him to. Or number two, he just wants to get all the screen time he wants on air. Because I can assure you, oh, CNN, we're going to follow this live, bring you every word, Fox News, all of them. They're going to cover it, and it's just going to be a load of BS. Like, it, yeah. So that's my theories on why he's doing this little report thing, which I'm going to call BS on. But he got a response to that true social message about the riggers from current Republican governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, 
on Twitter, who said, quote, The 2020 election in Georgia was not stolen. For nearly three years now, anyone with evidence of fraud has failed to come forward under oath and prove anything in a court of law. Our elections in Georgia are secure, accessible, and fair, and will continue to be as long as I am governor. The future of our country is at stake in 2024, and that must be our focus, unquote. And again, y'all, we are not talking about some moderate John McCain Republican here. Brian Kemp is a very hard right conservative who signed into law the extremely restrictive voting rights bill, an extremely restrictive abortion bill. He likes to attack the current president on social media. Like, once again, we're not talking about some moderate middle of the aisle. We're talking about a hard right Republican conservative. And yet, on this one issue, once again, if you don't agree with Dear Leader, I'm sorry, but you're out, Brian. Oh my gosh. But from those devoted to the president on this issue, because there are Republicans who are, who either because they truly are that dumb and believe that the election was stolen or that they know the election wasn't stolen would want to be kept in the good graces of dear leader. But from those devoted to the president, they'll once again find anything to try and turn the argument against the other side. Like a beauty, Charlie Kirk. I think he's a part of Turning Point USA, that garbage, whatever. He said on Twitter, after the indictment came out, quote, watching cable TV and tweeting can now get you indicted, unquote. Interesting. Or someone on Twitter named Greg Price, who bought his blue check, I guess, who said, quote, things that are now illegal according to the Georgia indictment, asking people for phone numbers, reserving rooms in a Capitol building, telling people to watch TV, getting people to attend legislative hearings, unquote. Of course, as I said earlier, these things solely, we know they aren't illegal. But as you would know from reading the indictment, which I doubt Greg Price or Charlie Kirk even did, even though we're not talking about some Democratic Party manifesto, we're talking about an official legal indictment that was filed in a court of law by prosecutors, by a district attorney. As you would know, by reading the indictment, these things together are part of the buildup of that conspiracy. So I did see, I did like this response to Greg Price's tweet on Twitter that was sarcastically, quote, so suddenly it's a crime to buy a plane ticket with 10 of your best friends on 9-11, unquote. Yeah, yeah. But you see what it means. Buying that plane ticket in and of itself, no, it's not a crime. But when it builds up to an illegal conspiracy, like you bought the plane ticket to commit the 9-11 terrorist attacks, then it becomes a crime. You hate to see it. Yeah, and so there was another response to Charlie Kirk's tweet that I saw. It was a tweet from April that read, quote, So the new right-wing thing is describing crimes as generically as possible to pretend like they're not crimes. Someone gets convicted of conspiracy and they start yelling, Wow, it's so illegal to make plans with friends now! Unquote. Which, as I just read, it's kind of spot on. Like, that's kind of what they're doing. Watching cable TV and tweeting can now get you indicted. Things that are now illegal. Asking people for phone numbers. Like... (laughs) <laughs> we kind of just exposed their little thingy. Oh, okay. Oh, well. They'll have to go back to using woke for everything or whatever. But then there's also Lindsey Graham, who's probably lucky he wasn't charged in that indictment, by the way. Lindsey Graham said on Fox News on Monday night that, quote, this should be decided at the ballot box and not in a bunch of liberal jurisdictions trying to put the man in jail, unquote. Of course, This indictment should be decided at the ballot box. This indictment came out of efforts to undermine the very result that the ballot box produced. So wouldn't you think that the people under the indictment would try and manipulate the result at the ballot box? Oh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. I got that from Twitter, too. That was pretty good. So, y'all, they just don't quit. It doesn't matter. How much factual evidence you put in front of them. 98 pages, 
of an indictment, and then three other indictments that are all factual, that has backed up factual evidence, backed up by a court of law. They just... It doesn't matter how much factual evidence you put in front of them, they'll say the color of the sky is green. They just can't get over, dear leader. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know this, but that is the definition of a cult. Like, plain as day. Like, if you look up the definition of cult on Google from Oxford Languages, quote, a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object. Um, I feel like that kind of describes the Republican Party and Donald Trump right now. Like, wouldn't you say? But anyways, to recap all of what I just spewed, all the facts that I just spewed, by the way, Trump is in some hot doo-doo. Things are not going well for former President Donald Trump. He's just been indicted for the fourth time. And when we take a look at this indictment compared to, you know, the others, the three others, it might be the most damning yet. Like I'd say, um, I guess if I had to rank them, the election-related indictments are probably the worst for Trump. One and two, you could probably switch them over. I mean, the 98 pages is kind of, there are 18 other people. But also, there's something I'm going to bring up in a minute, which is kind of bad. So those are kind of one and two right there. Then you've got the classified documents case. And then, of course, the hush money payment case, which is up in New York. So, you know, I'd probably say that's the least bad for him. But even being indicted once, even if that was the only one, he would still be the only former president in the history of the United States of America since 1776, y'all, who has been indicted. So even being indicted once is bad. Four times, all at once? That's a bit rough. But, as I said just a second ago, what may tip this Georgia case over the edge, over the rest, is that unlike with the federal cases, the President of the United States can't pardon someone from state crimes. We're not talking about a federal criminal trial. We're talking about a state criminal trial in Georgia. It was brought by a state prosecutor, a district attorney, not a federal prosecutor, which means the president of the U.S. can't pardon Trump if he's convicted. Now, if he's convicted in the other federal cases, and he becomes president somehow, some way again. Yeah, sure. He could, I guess he could pardon those. It's kind of legally murky if he could pardon himself for those federal crimes anyways. But also, in Georgia, the governor doesn't even have pardon power in the state of Georgia. And I don't know if Brian Kemp would want to pardon Trump anyway. They're not the best of friends, as you saw from that Twitter exchange. But in Georgia, only the State Board of Pardons and Paroles can grant a pardon or a form of clemency. But the catch is, even to that catch, another catch is that a pardon can only be granted in the state of Georgia when a sentence is complete. So even if he's convicted, and even if someone the board, whatever, wanted to pardon him. Under state law, they couldn't until his sentence is over. This is true. And if he's convicted under that first count with the RICO law, that's a minimum of five years. Now, it doesn't have to be prison time. It can be probation. But he can't be pardoned for that crime until the sentence is already over. Which is, you know, Georgia is like one of a few states that are like that, which is really interesting and would be a bit of an issue for him if he is convicted. And another difference could be that we're much more likely to be able to actually watch this trial take place than the federal trials, because in Georgia, most court cases are televised, but it is extremely rare for a federal trial to be televised. And listen, y'all, if we got to watch this thing on TV, I mean, listen, forget the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial that took over the internet last year. Even, I wasn't around, 
But if you were around during the OJ trial, that was, you know, that was massive. This would probably be even bigger, an even bigger spectacle than the OJ trial. And even in this era of not as many people watching TV anymore, people are going to tune in to watch the former president of the United States standing trial in a courtroom, an orange one, in fact, for attempting to overturn the results of an election he lost. It would be unprecedented. A former president of the United States has never been indicted, nor less convicted. It would be extraordinary. And, you know, we'd also be able to, you know, see the wheels of justice in motion, which is pretty cool. But ultimately, we're probably going to have to wait until those trials, likely all four of them, take place next year for any other further developments. Because this fourth investigation in Georgia was kind of the one that was going to wrap this all up, all the investigations. There's not really any pending investigations anymore. They've all, <laughs> they've all produced indictments. So for any really future updates on all this, we're going to have to wait until the trials take place, which let's hope happen before the election next year. And all that happens while Trump is still far and away the front runner for the Republican nomination for president. Because Ronald McDonald to Santa Claus is not turned, it's not going well for him, y'all. He's a strange dude. And so that, you know, the fact that he's probably at that point going to be the Republican frontrunner while the primaries are going on, these trials are going to be happening. Even, you know, that's going to add to what it's going to be next year. I mean, y'all, that would be something. And the fact is right now, the polling that a lot of people are putting out, or at least I've seen on social media and the news outlets say, Biden and Trump, neck and neck, in 2024 race. Y'all, let me just remind you, we are over a year, a year and two or three months from the presidential election in 2024. Now is not the time to be looking at a Washington Post poll and being like, oh my gosh, how is Biden tied with Trump? Like, um, maybe it's because you're looking at polling over a year out. Like, at this point in 2015, I don't think Donald Trump was the frontrunner of the Republican nomination. We certainly didn't know that Joe Biden was going to be the Democratic nominee. That was, you know, maybe it was likely, but it was far from a given. We had, maybe somebody had a clue. But a lot of people, most people had no clue in 2007 at this point that Barack Obama was going to be the Democratic nomination and dominate his way to the presidency in 2008. We didn't know that at this point in 2007. Things change. So to look at polling right now and get all worked up is silly when it's 43% to 43% or 40% to 40% or whatever. Like, because y'all, I don't think we talk about this enough on this podcast. We really haven't in the last year or so because Congress has been divided and not a lot of stuff has passed. But the current president, Joe Biden, I think has done a lot of good stuff and gotten a lot of stuff passed, which I should do a future podcast on, and I'd vote for him again. But a lot of people like to say the economy is bad. A lot of people don't understand what the economy is. They just look at the gas prices and the inflation and say, oh, it's terrible, even though the inflation's gone way down, by the way. And then, of course, there is the fact that Biden is over 80 years old, which, you know, would I rather have someone younger? Yeah. But he's the incumbent. He's going to run again. The other Democratic nominee is RFK Jr., who believes vaccines are the devil. So, you know what? I'll support him. And maybe there are a bunch of people who are, you know, not too thrilled about having to vote for someone as old as Biden or, you know, kind of nervous about voting for somebody as old as him. But then you have to take a look at the other side. And see the other man, Donald Trump. And I think there's a lot of people, and it's not reflected in the polling right now, who, if that happens, if the general election comes and it's a Trump Biden rematch, will look at one side and say, well, that guy's really old and he's been president for four years. And then take a look at the other side and be like, holy. 
That dude is freaking nuts. And I ain't voting for him. And, like, that's gonna be the thing. Like, Joe Biden may be old, and maybe the economy isn't at its greatest point ever right now, but people are gonna be looking at the other side and be like, oh, it's you again? I don't think so, because you mean no more democracy, which is kind of the point for some of them who are supporting them. They just want all the power. And that is a bit of an issue. And that's why, basically, like, listen, the two-party system is terrible, and it's bad, and I don't like it. But a vote for a third party or not voting is a vote for Donald Trump, y'all, because it takes away a vote from Joe Biden, who is the only chance there is to beat him and stop basically the slide into authoritarianism. As you can see by the indictment and saying that the election was rigged, this is terrible, and the insurrection, how far they will go to try and get their way. There's only one vote that you can make that would stop that. And if you don't check that box, you're basically helping the guy who wants to not allow you to have the freedom to check any box on that sheet you want. So I'm just saying, I'll get off my soapbox. Obviously, once we get closer to it next year, 2024, on this podcast, on the newsletter, on all the facts, we're going to be talking much more about the trials, would they happen? Oh my gosh. And the election, of course. It's going to be our first presidential election next year if we make it that far. Sanders facts, let's hope. I mean, we'll see. But those are basically all the facts that I have regarding the fourth indictment of the former President Donald Trump. And those are all the facts that I've got for this week's edition of the podcast, y'all. Thank you all so much for listening. Remember that if you like the Zaders Facts podcast, if you think you're going to like all the facts on this week's edition, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 115, rate and review the podcast, and then check us out on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, at Zaders Facts, that's Xander with a Z, and most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts! Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about the newsletter, Xander's Weekend Facts, about Xander's Facts on YouTube, because all our new episodes, including this one, get posted to YouTube with a nice background. You can subscribe, watch, check it out. Go do that. Xander's Facts on YouTube. That link is also in this episode's description. And then check out the Xander's Facts link tree, because that has all the Xander's Facts links that you need for the podcast, for the newsletter, for the YouTube link. All that stuff is also linked in this episode's description, Sanders Facts Linktree. So, those are basically all the facts I have for you on episode 115. Next week, we will have a brand new podcast once again, capitalizing on all our newfound fame when so many people come and listen to this podcast that has a lot of facts. Next week, though, we're also going to have something factual, episode 116, like we do every single week. That's coming out next Wednesday, August. 23rd so go check that out next week episode 116 but that is it that is a wrap on episode 115 of the xander's facts podcast thank you all so much for listening and we'll see y'all with episode 116 next week the caravan of mostly central american immigrants is now in the mexican city of Guadalajara.